Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Shraddha. Thank you. You guys are too kind. Um, please don't believe much of this. When I walked in this morning, Shraddha said, Shalinder, you still look sleepy. Uh, and, and the reality is, uh, I, I was working till 2.30 last night, much like many of, uh, many of you guys do as entrepreneurs. So excuse me if I'm, uh, uh, you know, if I come across like that. <clears throat> but, uh, uh, you know, it's terrific to be here. You know, hats off to uh, Shraddha and the team at Your Story. They do, a, they do an unbelievable job every time of uh, assembling a terrific set of entrepreneurs. And, and for all of you who have traveled here from outside Bangalore, you know, I'm, I, I've recently moved to Bangalore. Uh, you know, as you come and experience the city, I think I, think, uh, I would encourage more people to consider a move here. This is a, this is a phenomenal city uh, to be based out of and build a company uh, in. Um, uh, today's topic uh, is... Is e-commerce investing, uh, you know, investing in e-commerce in India, and what I wanted to do with all of you today, and, and uh, you know, all of you should feel free to jump in and ask questions. What I wanted to do was uh, give people a context uh, first of uh, uh, e-commerce in China, and, and I'll explain why. Actually, let me step back for a second. I, uh, you know, I shouldn't at all presume that many of you know us. Let me give you a quick background on myself and the firm. Uh, I work for a firm called Sequoia Capital. Uh, we manage about 7,000 crores of capital committed to India, and we invest from the seed stage up until the growth stage. And we've made, uh, over the last uh, six years, we've made about 75 different investments. Uh, we have a team in three offices. Um, we uh, sort of culturally try to think and act like entrepreneurs ourselves, um, and sort of that's our motto. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, I won't get much into, uh, into uh, describing ourselves. I'll stick to the topic, but I thought I should introduce ourselves. I've personally been investing in India in technology, Internet, uh, and such for about six years also for the same duration. So I'll start with lessons from China. And, and uh, we think that what, what's happening in India actually can be connected back to many of the lessons in China. And unlike, unlike people associating e-commerce with Amazon, uh, much of what's happening here is actually not what Amazon did in the U.S. And only there are, there are far fewer linkages uh, to the U.S. or to developed markets than there are to China. And I think some of this is important to understand as, uh, as, as we think about life here. So who knows uh, who this person is? Correct, I heard somebody in the audience. This person is Jack Ma. And uh, he... Uh, he runs a, uh, a group called the Alibaba Group in China, which has been an unbelievable uh, innovator in payments, in e-commerce, in online marketplaces. And Taobao Group is China's largest e-commerce company. Interestingly, Taobao Group is not B2C. It's a marketplace model. And Taobao Group brings together buyers and sellers uh, who, who put goods up and, uh, and, and people come and buy you know, you could think of it as akin to eBay, but works a little bit differently. It doesn't have listing fees. It's actually free to the merchant. So just to understand how important this, this lesson from China is, I'll do a quick show of hands, and I'll set some context for you. Our estimate is that the biggest e-commerce company in India has about, you know, maybe 2 million registered users, uh, if that. Um, let's take a guess on how many Taobao has, and I will put out some numbers uh, 50 million, 100 million, 200 million, 400 million. And uh, how many people think it's 50 million? Which would be about 25 times. Okay, so somebody's caught on that the number has to be bigger. <laughs> how many people think it's 100 million? How many people think it's 200 million? And how many think it's 400 million? Very few. So the answer is actually more than 400 million. So Taobao has more than 400 million registered users. Now let's do a, just to give people a sense of the scale. We'll talk about number of units sold at Taobao per, per minute, not per day. You know, most e-commerce companies measure themselves by number of transactions per, done per day. And let's do a show of hands. How many do you think Taobao does per minute on average? These are stats that are available for 2010 that they disclose to the market. Uh, per minute, 100. Per minute, 1,000. Per minute, 10,000. Per minute, 50,000. <laughs> All right, I should have picked 200,000 maybe. <laughs> um, multiple choice, that's why it fails, and some of us uh, can, can do these exams quite well by process of elimination. Uh, 
So, so yeah, the answer is more than 50,000 transactions or more than 50,000 items sold every minute. That is staggering. By any sense, you know, that is staggering. The number of items listed on Taobao, you know, is, uh, again, this time I won't go into how many, 800 million items are listed on Taobao. And when we talk to India's leading e-commerce companies, we're looking at, you know, numbers in the vicinity of 10, 20,000, maybe 50,000 if, if they have a very, very, very deep catalog. And compare 50,000 or max 100,000 maybe to 800 million items listed. So I think it's important to understand what's happening today because, you know, a lot of the investors are common across India and China, and a lot of the companies here are trying to follow the strategies that have worked in China. And so that's why I give this Taobao example and put up Jack Ma, who has, has done in China what, what is quite unbelievable. Uh, and, you know, in the time to come for e-commerce, you know, it's likely Jeff Bezos and him will be treated in the same vein. Uh, and, and he's perhaps every bit as great as, as Jeff Bezos is. So here are the metrics. 350, 350, uh, 370 million registered users, 50 million uniques every day, 800 million product listings, 3.6 million stores on, on Taobao, and 48,000 items sold every minute. This is average for all of 2010. This year's number is probably closer to you know, 60 to 100% more than this. So this number could be, uh, actually you all should be on the lookout. Next week they'll probably disclose their metrics for 2011, and this number may be 75 to 100,000. <laughs> so let's talk about B2C in China. Now, just coming back, Taobao is so big, and, and it is probably 70, 80% of China's e-commerce market, but like I said, it's B2B. Uh, it's, uh, it's a marketplace model. And in India, we haven't yet seen the marketplace model take off. So one very big difference, dissimilarity. Although there will be in the, in the next, um, you know, you will see in the, in the imminent future, there will be many attempts. There are some already. Uh, you know, some companies are seeing early success. But there's going to be many, many attempts to build uh, marketplace models. And there's a lot of merit to these models because there's very strong network effects. And, you know, more, more suppliers attract more buyers, more buyers attract more suppliers, and so the network effects keep getting stronger and stronger. So there's the strong winner-take-all dynamics. But let's go to B2C in China, which is, you know, people who are running in e-retail, which is much more akin to India. And uh, this is a rough split of, uh, of the various leading players. T-Mall uh, has, you know, the lion's share of the B2C market. Take a guess who T-Mall is. This is also Taobao Mall. <laughs> so uh, Taobao, after a while, said, I will allow brands to put up their, show, their stores uh, on, our, uh, on our website. They launched this product, shockingly, 11 months ago, in, uh, on November 1st of 2010. And uh, uh, in 10 days uh, after that, on November 11th, they clocked 150 million of revenues in one day. And, and, and now they dominate uh, the Chinese e-commerce market. But the second guy here, 360 Buy, is also a very interesting company. You could call them the largest independent Chinese B2C e-commerce company. And the third guy, uh, actually, there's Dang Dang, which is publicly listed, and Joyo. Joyo is Amazon uh, in China. And you'll see what, where Amazon is at. And I'll, I'll, I'll relate this back to India in just a minute by, let's double click on 360 Buy. Uh, 360 by story is quite interesting. The, the rest of e-commerce in the Western world starts, started with books. And Joyo in China started with books as well, and Amazon went and bought them. But 360 by started with 3C, which is electronics. Uh, 3C stands for uh, you know, uh, communications, electronics products. And, and that is a fundamentally very different strategy. Very, very low gross margin business grew very fast. But I think the key is they did something different. And their key insight was this is the largest market. This is the hook to get a very large number of customers. If you do electronics, you'll get a massive number of customers, and then over time you will you know, transition them to other products. Um, and books had many advantages and long-tail advantages, etc. But what's worked in China is actually quite different from what's worked in the United States and in developed markets, and that's the point I'm trying to make. This company also, for the first time anywhere in the world, did own, own logistics. And they said, hey, a third-party logistics provider is not good enough, and I will build my own warehouses, I will build my own uh, same-day delivery capability, not even next day, which Amazon gives you in the U.S., same-day delivery capability. 
uh, in China and have now uh, thousands of people uh, offering a superior service than any third party courier could and have built from the ground up a supply chain infrastructure, uh, 360 by, which is now you know, many billions of dollars in revenue, um, is, in, is every bit as much a logistics company as it is an e-commerce company. Uh, and a very sophisticated uh, logistics company to be able to do the same day deliveries uh, and, and own supply chain. And the reason this is important is you're seeing the trend in India of all the leading e-commerce companies try to do own delivery and try to do this in-house because there's lots of problems with courier companies, you know, uh, COD is an issue, you know, high returns and the unit economics uh, not adding up. So, uh, and they have less than 1% returns uh, for many billions in sales. So the culture that 360 buy and the, and the focus was, there were some similarities with Amazon. They said, we want to offer unbelievable service to the consumer. But, they, but how they solved for that was very different. And they adapted to the Chinese uh, environment and conditions. And then uh, from the prior slide, if you notice, there are three things colored here. The green, which is, a, which is a market platform, different from India, and adapted for China. You don't have a market platform like this in the US as prominent. Amazon has this inside it, but, but perhaps not, not in relative terms as successful. Um, or, or it may be, I don't know. Uh, then you have the retail channel, which I talked about. And, th and then you have another innovation, which is called own brand. And own brand is also a Chinese phenomenon. This is new to, to the e-commerce world, that e-commerce is a big enough channel where you could launch new brands on it. And you could, from the ground up, and say, hey, I'll design my own clothes and apparel. And so another big success in China is this company, Vankel, uh, which also has uh, you know, very, very large amounts of revenues, and basically launched a brand on the web and said, you know, this brand doesn't have physical stores. It doesn't have you know, prior uh, existence and an a, you know, offline track record. But the internet is a channel enough, especially because it's social and viral and people can engage and learn about a product and refer it to friends, et cetera. It's actually a pretty powerful medium. So this is a new trend, um, if you will, that Chinese companies have set off. And in India, you've seen investments in, in Zovi and Yepmi. And yesterday, we announced an investment in a company called Free Culture, which are all own brands you know, uh, launched on the web. And, but, but these insights are actually all coming from China. So I think in summary, what I'll say about China is the following. Uh, the companies that have really made a difference there are very different from uh, the conventional Western thinking. These companies have adapted tremendously to what would work in China. They have, they have built in innovation or, or, and, and massive infrastructure needed for doing local logistics. They have innovated to go build own brands on the web, and they have scaled a lot. Uh, we have companies in the Sequoia China portfolio ourselves that have over 100 million in revenues in China with own brands launched only on the web. And so there are many more examples, not just Vankel. Um, and and uh, I'm not talking here about a payments company called Alipay, also belonging to the Alibaba group, that was instrumental in, in bringing down the payments cost in China tremendously and solving the payments piece uh, of e-commerce. But through these various uh, you know, different companies and initiatives, the e-commerce ecosystem in China uh, has really evolved. And uh, we find that to see, to understand the actions of a Flipkart in India or a Let's Buy in India, you can very quickly map them back to how, how things are evolving in China. However, uh, I, I would urge each of these companies and everybody here in the audience to think how you should adapt to India, because India is not China, just like China is not the West. Uh, you know, India has more similarities with China, but India is not China. And um, uh, so let's come to India now. Uh, hopefully I've set some context and groundwork because from our lens, it's very tough to understand what's going on in India unless you map it to equivalent other emerging markets because e-commerce is evolving very differently all over the world. And this has been often said, but the one very big similarity between India and China and e-commerce is from an investing perspective, from, from my vantage point, um, you know, India and China don't have organized retail uh, in a very large proportion. So it is quite likely that the e-commerce leader can be the largest retailer in that category. And if that thesis were to pay out, we'll see, relatively speaking, uh, disproportionately large e-commerce companies versus physical retail companies. And that's, that's a very big dissimilarity with, with the, the developed world like the U.S. or Europe. And, 
you know, but for that to happen, there are some roadblocks. So let's talk about what's happening in India in e-commerce. So in India in e-commerce, the first sort of big, big state of the market is that leaders are emerging. And uh, this is important because once the leaders start emerging, there is a very natural gravitation in e-commerce. You guys saw what the B2C chart for China looked like and how quickly it tapers off in market share terms from the big guys to the small guys. Uh, and then, you know, China has a ton of e-commerce companies uh, that are not on that map. In fact, I have a very interesting anecdote from China. I did a trip there to, uh, uh, along with my colleague Akash here, who's in the audience, in August to meet our Chinese e-commerce company, Sequoia, as a, as a, a you know, similarly large presence in China as we have in India. And we met many of these companies. One of them asked me, said, how many Groupon clones do you have in India? So we said, oh, there's too many. There's, you know, there's 20 Groupon clones. And so they said, we have 10,000. <laughs> uh, which gives you a sense of you know, how many companies there are in China. The entrepreneurial ecosystem is very, very, very developed. And even for that developed an ecosystem, and that deeper market where, that, you're, that you're hearing Taobao's numbers, uh, there is a steep drop off in the big companies versus the smaller companies versus the smaller companies. So uh, the reason I'm sharing this with you is if you were to put on an investor's hat, uh, most people believe that there's a winner take all uh, phenomena that, that comes in technology and e-commerce investing because scale is a very big driver of efficiencies. Scale is a very big driver of making the math work, the unit economics work because these end up being very low margin businesses in the long term. Um, and so these winners are emerging uh, in various categories and uh, I'm not here to judge or say you know who, who, which of these will become the leaders in their categories uh, over time but there's several uh, companies which are now funded with a critical amount of capital. And my uh, advice to most entrepreneurs here in the audience would be, uh, don't be a me too. Think like Jack Ma thought in China, think disruptive. You have to think out of the box because uh, for the obvious things, you know, uh, these companies will get the lion's share, they will attract the lion's share of capital. Uh, and, and they will have the advantage of being there early, being, being having, you know, uh, gotten big quite fast. And these companies are also seeing very, very positive trends in terms of how consumers are adopting e-commerce. And I'm sure you, all of you are here because you believe in it. Um, however, there's one, one sobering uh, piece about e-commerce in India. And this is where we are very, very different from China. And this is representative, so don't think about the, don't try to do the math. Uh, uh, but, but the summary is that the math doesn't add up uh, in India in e-commerce. And uh, this is counterintuitive. This, this point I'm making is counterintuitive to what you'll hear from, from everyone in the industry. But as the market uh, is in this current phase of lots of interest, lots of excitement, lots of hype, uh, you know, there is, there is a, when you do the unit economic math and say I ship a product, in this case, for 1,200 rupees, and I back out, you know, my gross margin, I back out my discounts and couponing, I back out my shipping and logistics cost. You know, most companies are operating on a negative contribution margin uh, or, you know, very, very close to zero contribution margin. This means that on a per unit basis, most companies are either losing money on a variable cost basis or barely breaking even. And our view is the vast majority of the companies are already losing money on a variable basis. Now, why is that the case? It's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but if everybody does it, and then the industry as a whole does it, then it's a problem. <laughs> but the reason it is like this is because of the Chinese example. Because everybody wants to get that 40, 48,000 transactions happening uh, you know, on their site per minute, and they're betting that scale will solve all their problems. But uh, you know, India is a fundamentally different market, and the... Um, the word of caution is that people could be under, could be overestimating, uh, you know, how easy it is to get there. And in the process, when this phase comes to market, when everybody spends a tremendous amount of capital and decides to do business with zero or negative margin, then you know, uh, you know, very few people. Uh, it's going to be a last man standing phenomenon. And in a last man standing phenomenon, these guys have the advantage because they already have market leadership and they will attract the lion's share of capital. So, uh, what does this mean? Uh, and, and I'll go to that in a minute, but just to double click a little bit on why, why the math is not adding up. 
uh, and the and the main differences for that, in our view. The math is not adding up because in India the average selling price is lower, uh, relative to China, relative to most emerging markets, which means that on a per transaction basis, the uh, the average selling price of the goods is much lower, and the the absolute rupees of contribution available to make the unit economics work is a lot lower. So, for example, I'm on the board of a company called Fashion and You, and uh, uh, they are they were incubated by a group that incubated private sales businesses in you know eight or ten countries. And so, in November, in the month of November, I spent time with CEOs of the same business in many different countries and got to compare the metrics of the same business in many different countries, you know, in Brazil, in Turkey, in Russia, in, uh, in India, obviously, in Australia, in Switzerland, in Germany, in, you know, different parts of the world. And it was quite stark that, that on, a, on a number of transactions done basis, on repeat buying, on uh, consumer engagement, Fashion and New had exceptionally strong metrics relative to this group. But where the metrics became a little bit tougher to make work was because, you know, in foreign markets, people pay more for goods and services. And they, uh, their propensity to pay is higher, and that's not about to change. So this has some implications on how each of you, as you think about your e-commerce ventures, um, you know, think about tweaking your, your business model. And Shraddha, if I'm running over, uh, please, please do uh, interrupt. <laughs> so... Um, so that's low ASP. Second, the payments infra is broken. I mentioned this company, Alipay, in China. Alipay brought down the payments uh, fees to about, you know, uh, to below 50 basis points for the larger companies. In India, uh, given fraud and other issues, we are looking at 1.5% to 2%. You know, 1% for e-commerce is a lot, <laughs> you know, as you all know. And, and this hits, uh, this straight hits the unit economics. In addition to that, there's a lot of failure rate in India across the payment gateways. So we know of companies which have, you know, double digit, more than 10% failed transactions. So, you, you know, here you paid a lot of money, acquired a customer, tried to transact, payment failed. I mean, that's a massive, massive, massive problem. This year at Sequoia, we made three investments in payments because we feel unless the payments issues get solved, uh, you know, it's a big impediment uh, for e-commerce to grow. The next one is that logistics are inefficient. Everybody knows that each of you who's trying to ship stuff uh, out uh, to consumers is painfully aware of how difficult this is. Um, and a few companies are trying to take the first step in building local logistics. But it's unclear whether the unit economics of local logistics will work in India or not. Because local logistics works if you have a tremendous amount of scale, you know, per geography where you're going to put your own people feet on the street to actually deliver goods. So uh, I would urge everyone here in the room to think hard about how you want to do logistics. Local logistics may be, in fact, the right answer. Um, but, you know, you may have to be creative and think about models of partnering with affiliates, you know, doing some on your own, doing some with affiliates, franchising. Uh, you know, the, the umbrella needs to be pushed here in our view. The next one is uh, uh, customer acquisition cost, and sorry for using an acronym, uh, is very high in India. Just to give you an example, in China, most e-commerce companies operate in customer acquisition cost in the 3 to $7 range. The better companies are at 3 to $4, 150 to 200 rupees. Uh, the uh, the more niche companies are at seven or eight dollars, about three hundred to four hundred rupees. In India, our sense is the customer acquisition costs for the better companies are four hundred to six hundred, and for for those that are in niche markets is over a thousand rupees. Probably the mean is in the eight hundred to a thousand rupee range. When you marry the higher higher customer acquisition cost, um, and the fact that you have a lower average selling price then it means that for a per-customer basis, you need many more transactions to break even than in China. Uh, so the, the math in India is, uh, doesn't add up as well as it does in other parts of the world, just to give an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Again, what that means is that the winners here, uh, even though there are some companies here where early winners are emerging, you know, these guys may not necessarily be the long-term. Some of them could be disruptive if you can outthink them. Uh, if you can solve some of these problems, uh, and lastly, irrational competition, and uh, you know the industry will every industry goes through phases of irrational competition, and uh, and we think e-commerce is certainly going through a phase of irrational competition, and you know it's only uh, you know it could get worse, but it'll get better too. Uh, and we saw this in travel many years ago, where where all the OTAs would would give so many cashbacks that they would bleed on a per transaction basis. And so this will perhaps evolve. The irrational competition will hopefully get, get better. Um, 
But here are some questions. Uh, and, and I would urge everyone in the room to think different. And think about you know, how you can outthink uh, the guys who are emerging as early winners versus necessarily trying to out-execute them because they have the execution advantage already. So given this is a gathering of, uh, of younger companies, uh, I, I thought I would try to you know, you know, put some ideas for you on, on how to outthink them. Um, and there are companies uh, that are able to do some of these things. Um, and here are some ideas. Can you acquire customers for cheaper? Uh, you know, some companies are trying to do this through a mix of B2B and B2C models. Uh, can you innovate with payments? Uh, again, there are companies in India trying to currently, you know, find innovative solutions for payments and trying to build that as part of their e-commerce. Um, you know, can you deliver through affiliates? So this goes to, uh, you know, the, the problem of local logistics, which, which Chinese companies solved a different way, but in India, perhaps, you know, you, you, make, you, you may consider, you know, an affiliate model. Uh, that could help with the last mile of logistics. Um, could you create your own brand? This is a lesson borrowed from China, and we are seeing uh, early signs of this happening. But you know, the the traditional thinking has been to create your own brand in apparel. Uh, you know, we have a company called Micromax in our portfolio that created their own brand in mobile phones. You know, offline. But the lesson could be you could create consider creating your own brand in, in completely new categories. But you have to think through which categories to pick and why. Uh, could you, could you have any other supply side advantages or innovation? So uh, what is important here is, you know, why was books the natural category for, for a lot of e-commerce to succeed? Because there is a lot of supply side advantages in books. It's one of the few industries that gives you lots of time to pay the supplier. So you can build a big catalog and don't have to pay them. Uh, and, and, you know, it's the easiest place to have long tail uh, benefits, SEO working for you, and have negative working capital. And, and that's why it's such a great place. Uh, to, to, to start in e-commerce. But, but it has some, some natural supply-side advantages versus other categories. So could you, could you think about uh, you know, other segments or categories? Um, uh, could you, and some of these are obvious, you know, network effects, offer better service. And when I say offer better service, the company I have in mind is our portfolio company in the U.S., Zappos, which is known for its customer service. And uh, we had the founder and um, uh, chairman of Zappos with us in India in November and met with many of our e-commerce companies. It was heartening to hear how they built a business on the back of 38% returns. Zappos had 38% returns when Amazon bought them, yet had more operational efficiency than Amazon themselves. And post-acquisition, Amazon has, has moved their shoes fulfillment and operations business to Zappos. And the company was built on the mantra of, uh, uh, of delighting customers. And, um, and lastly, clear lower create lower cost infrastructure and, uh, and, and, a, and an operating model. And, and this is where I think people could, could think quite creatively in India because uh, you know, the, the current wave of companies is all skewing towards losing more money and they're not necessarily focused on cost. And eventually it'll matter. It'll mat everybody's cost structure will matter a lot in a low margin business. Um, uh, the next sort of big piece of advice uh, that I have for all the, all the e-commerce entrepreneurs is e-commerce is a highly, highly analytical business. So do the math. This really, really matters. You know, what your conversion funnel looks like, what your per customer economics is, how many times are they purchasing, how many people are they referring, what percentage of referrals convert. It's, these, it's the small changes to these numbers that will determine uh, whether or not uh, you have attractive unit economics or not. Again, I'll give you guys an example. You know, this time I'll give Zappos as example. And the Chinese companies also have very strong metrics on this. But Zappos broke even on their customer acquisition cost on the first order shipped. So the, the contribution margin on the first order shipped was equal to the customer acquisition cost. And uh, you know, what we're seeing in India is very, very different. Uh, you know, typically it's taking three, four transactions, sometimes up to eight or 10 transactions to recover the contribution margin, to not recover the fixed cost, to not recover the overheads, to not recover marketing cost yet, to only recover the contribution, uh, from, only from the contribution margin, uh, the customer acquisition cost. Uh, so every little cost matters. Uh, uh, you know, Zappos had a saying that, uh, that everything matters. Uh, and and you, as CEOs running a company, an e-commerce business, uh, you know, the, the, the natural thinking is to prioritize a few things versus others. But, 
in e-commerce, every little detail matters, and so you need to be immensely detail-oriented, uh, and especially as you do the math. Uh, the third one is honest calculations. <laughs> this, is, this is because, you know, we have met maybe a few dozen e-commerce companies uh, in the last, uh, you know, year or two years, uh, and, and a big crop in the recent past, and we find that there's a lot of funny math going on. <laughs> um, and in fact, I think it was Deloitte or one of the accounting firms wrote a paper on the funny accounting in e-commerce companies. So uh, here are some funny anecdotes. You know, you go to a company, they say, hey, we have really high gross margins. This is a great business. You know, we'll, we'll break even uh, on, on the uh, whatever second or third transaction. But then you say, hey, is couponing part of gross margin or not? Is it, is it a marketing spend? Or is, it, uh, is discounts part of gross margin or not? You know, some people don't count discounts. They say, I have 30% gross margin, and they forget to factor in that they're giving 20% discount. So, so that's actually 10% gross margin. So there's a lot of funny accounting uh, that, that, that is going on. And as entrepreneurs, the one thing you can do for yourself is to be honest about, uh, you know, the, the truth will face you eventually. So the, the sooner that, that, the, that the, the industry as a whole starts to do, you know, a fully baked in economics, the better it is for everyone. Because until that happens, you know, that irrational competition will continue and people will keep believing that, um, you know, uh, th this, is a, this is a gravy trail. And then uh, last piece of advice is use as much as possible a variable cost structure. Uh, and this will help to get the unit economics in order uh, to the extent it is not. <sighs> Lastly, some examples. It can be done. <laughs> um, you know, our strong advice to each of our companies is innovate. Uh, you know, do not, uh, do not be... Uh, uh, happy to just be another e-commerce company that is copying a China or a U.S. strategy. Uh, localize, uh, as the Chinese companies does, but localize to Indian conditions. And, uh, you know, here are a few examples of our companies. Vaya is a company in travel which built a, a different business model from the OTAs, was founded at the same time. There's a price war in the OTA market, took the conscious decision, I will build a different model, uh, and did not go down that path. And uh, Vaya today does over 40,000 travel transactions every day. Uh, you know, equivalent or, or bigger than, than perhaps uh, the largest uh, or, or similar scale at least. And, and built, a, built a network of merchants all over the country, built a first prepaid B2B2C model in India in our view uh, of scale uh, and, and, and has terrific unit economics. Justile, which innovated in India for many, many, many years and built a phone-based search service, monetized through leads in the back end and didn't do what was conventional. They tweaked their model. They did something different. You know, Justile filed for an IPO in August of this year, so their numbers are now public, but it's a business with over 80% gross margin. Uh, and every time we, we heard, you know, uh, for, for years we have known Justile, all the time people said, isn't this a call center? Shouldn't this be a low margin business? And how do you equate, how do you uh, make peace with the fact that Google has gross margin in the 80s and Justile also has gross margin in the 80s? And one is a phone-led company, and the other is a technology company. You know, on the uh, you know sort of pure algorithmic search on the web. So again, the the learning is it can be done. Uh, and then uh, we have a couple of smaller companies whose examples we like a lot, which are innovating with new business models. Gharpay is innovating with a model to collect payments, and it's early days, and we'll see how it evolves. But at least there is that new thinking. They are trying to outthink, and 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 this company called Free Charge. I don't know how many people here know about it. But, uh, you know, they built a new mod model for couponing in India. And uh, they distribute more coupons uh, now online uh, through online customer transactions than the largest group buying sites. Um, and uh, and they, have, they have tied couponing to prepaid mobile recharge and, and to other uh, forms of online mobile recharge. This is an Indian company. You know, in the midst of those 20 Groupon clones, this company has out tried to outthink um, and, and do something innovative and different. So that would be my appeal to everyone: is to uh, is to try to outthink people and uh, and and uh, adapt and innovate. And uh, you know, we wish everyone good luck. And I hope this session was useful. Thank you so much.